Welcome to the Retailers Thriving in a Digital World panel. And if you're, if you're all of us, it's the highlight of our year. We look forward to this every year. And we thought we'd start with a great quote by the famed, I'm gonna introduce the panel in a second. Um, the famed David Ogilvy has a famous quote that is, the customer is not a moron, she is your wife. <laughs> The point of which is that you'll often hear us refer to our customers as she, and we're not just being the feminists that some of us are, uh, we're actually referring to who has most of the purchasing power globally. So we thought we'd make that point immediately because um, great longtime retailers like a lot of us um, have internalized that information. Thank you for being here. I'm Dottie Madison, Senior Managing Director at Guggenheim Partners on the brand and consumer operator in residence, and we would love to introduce our panel to you. We have Silas, I thought you were on the phone, Silas, you're here. I just turned it off. No. <laughs> <laughs> this is Silas Chow, who's the president and CEO of Novel Holdings Corp Group. This is John Don Hockle, managing partner at Leonard Green Partners. We have Mindy Grossman, who's the CEO of HSNI. Jim Fielding, the CEO of Claire Stores, Inc., and David Simon, the chairman and CEO of Simon Property Group. So we have all of the arguments represented here. We have every angle of how to survive and thrive in a digital world here, we think. So let's start, um, I think we, let's set the stage, let's set the table. Can you pull up slide two for a moment? This is why we're here. Here is the percent change of e-commerce sales versus non-e-commerce sales. And like any great business people, we're always chasing growth. The num hey, David. The number was 15.6 of growth in Q4 2012 versus just 4% in all retail sales. So obviously, we want to chase growth. But we're asking ourselves, how do we survive when we're trained in a physical analog world? So we thought we'd start. Mindy, I'd love for you to start with your point of view about omni-channel shopping and how important it is to approach things from a holistic way. So the first thing I'm gonna debunk is we don't even use the word channel anymore. I actually think it's antiquated because by nature, a channel is siloed behavior. So what we're talking about is this new era of boundaryless retail, which is really about creating networks. And I think that's really important, especially in a digital world. And the key to note is that consumers are really forcing this drive to innovation and it's being driven by three things, technology, social networks, and mobility. And especially in the case of her, mobility becomes more and more important. And I think too many people think digital and they automatically think of Amazon and its price and its value and certainly that's important. But I think in order for people to thrive in this new environment, they really have to focus more on experience. And the way we look at it, there are four critical elements of experience. And the first is insights. And the power of data today, I think everybody's hearing about that. But the real key to it is not just data. It's how do you use data to create intimacy with your customer and whether that's taking the insights. And in our world, between our e-commerce and catalog businesses and our HSM businesses, just to give you a perspective, of our $3.2 billion, 50% of it is digital transactions. So obviously critical to our business. But we have the data on 59 million people from existing customers all the way to prospects. So how are we using that to create intimacy and connections. I think the second uh, thing that we feel strongly about is engagement. Um, what are you doing to really keep the customer there? In our world, it's about using content, and in particular, video content, a lot of community interaction on the sites. Um, we have 60,000 videos on the pages of HSN, uh, com. but how are we using them to give people information, entertainment, um, give them more information on products. Um, the third that I feel really strongly about is this idea of generosity. What are you doing to get a customer to interface with your brand every day, not just because you want to sell them something? And I think that's gonna become more and more important in what is your value proposition? So about a year and a half ago, 
we launched an, a gaming portal, the first retail gaming portal where you can actually go and play casual games. And why did we do it? We had the insights. We knew our customer loved to shop, loved to share in community, and loved to play casual games. So the idea was, why couldn't she do all of that with us? So of course, initially people said, why are you in the gaming business? Well, just to give you order of magnitude, we've had over 100 million game plays to date, 750,000 registered users who are coming every day, and while they happen to be playing the game, we're streaming the live broadcast. So again, something, you know, just when you have your mobile phone next to your bed, what are you giving someone that they need to connect with you first thing? And then I think lastly is the power of trust, because you don't have anything if that doesn't exist. So this idea of experience as a differentiator and the digital environment allows you to do that so well because you can create connections, you can create conversation, and you can create community and broadcast it so much more powerfully than you can do in a single uh, location. The so. entire room just left to go trade your stock. They're all buying <laughs> HSN <laughs> right now. They are they are bought into everything yeah, you're yeah. saying. That you say there are ten people left at the yeah. end. But let's ask the elephant in the room question, right? If we are going to be holistic as retailers, because you are not in a physical environment, I have to turn to David Simon and ask you, as one of the the, the top landlord to many of us, where you're where you're tenant. <laughs> How do you create Pay rent at the very beginning <laughs> of the month, and we're all uh, uh, right? But what have you done for me lately? What do you do about experience? Well, what do you offer your tenants in this digital world, David? Well, look, I think um, uh, we have a mission, and I'll try to define it uh, this way. Uh, obviously, uh, our retailers need to be part of that mission, but our mission is to get people to look up as opposed to look down. So what do I mean by that? At their mobile phones, they're you so intimately it. connected to. All they do, point. all the, the society today, all we do is look down. And what the mall environment is all about looking up. So uh, our job is to create an environment where people look up, look around, uh, and enjoy the experience. And obviously we need our retailers to help provide that, but um, I do think there is a beginning, and I'm making a prediction here, because okay, uh, this is rare, because I usually am wrong, that's why I don't make predictions, <laughs> uh, that we're about to start moving away from looking down and start to look up. And we are begging for community. Um, we're begging for it. And you know, all we, when we talk about community, all we talk about is the social community, and that clearly plays a, uh, an unbelievable role, but people are um, looking for community beyond what they might get from a digital world. So, uh, you know, that that's the mission. Now, how do we do that? I, I'm not really sure yet, to be frank with you, but uh, I know it's providing all sorts of diversity and retailer mix, creating community uh, events and rooms, um, having a wonderful ambiance, um, um, having the best retailer mix that we can, and it's different things for different m markets and different malls, but you know, our job is to get people to look up. It's that simple, so. Uh, but Mindy, Mindy, to your point about content being so important to express generosity and to engage your customer, how do you do that without a physical environment? See, see I actually, think that having a physical environment in today's world can also be an incredible asset. And for the first time, we're actually looking at, for some of our brands, what would that be? But my challenge to them is not what a traditional retail store would be, what is an experiential destination? Right. So if it's, if it's front gate, how do I create a spa environment where people are really coming to a spa or an outdoor environment where I'm actually going to have cafes or whatever that is. To your point, David, where can you bring communities together? However, for us, in the absence of that, um, we, we, what we have to do is become that destination and create a lot of conversation 
within the network itself, and more important, have them each support one another. So if we do a live broadcast, you know, we started getting very involved in the entertainment business, so we actually have a music series right now. Starting in June, we'll also be doing digital downloads. So how do I have a one-hour pre-show on Facebook that people come into, do the live broadcast in 96 million homes, and then have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with an artist in our lounge? Mm -hmm. So how do you create mechanisms to completely extend the conversation if you can't have somebody physical. Right, and I think John, earlier you were making the point when we talked a couple of days ago about how when we use the word digital, we're not just talking about product or a mechanism de of delivery, i.e. the music, but also this amplifying mechanism where customers now can speak to each other and speak to us directly in a way that they never could previously. And I'd love to hear how you guys are thinking about it, especially in your very engaged communities, in, your, in the pet stores, in bridal, in places where you have a really valuable customer proposition, a customer lifetime proposition, where if you get data early and you connect early with those customers, the enterprise value is off the charts. Right. Well, uh, customer engagement and customer sort of retention are, you know, have been issues forever. Uh, and e each of our companies, I, we have <clears throat> 12 or 15 retailers, have their own uh, approach. It, of course, it, it started way back when in, with the, uh, you know, the cards, basically, loyalty cards. And those have sort of shifted online. <clears throat> and as they've shifted online, uh, there's ways for sort of people to get involved. Uh, to the degree that it's a more emotional, not to do that, uh, but to the degree it's a more emotionally impactful category, such as pets, it mm -hmm. tends to be easier, or wellness, as in Whole Foods, it tends to be easier. Um, you know, other others, uh, not not quite so so much. But um, um, well, show of hands from the group, who thinks data is going to be important to your long-term enterprise value? You do, David? Sure. Jim does. You don't, Mindy? Of course, right? Well, could be. <laughs> right, of course. Depends on what you do with it, right? Of course. Silas, we'd love to talk a little bit about geography. And can you pull up slide two, the um, China versus U.S. growth in e-commerce sales? Silas has many investments and a lot of expertise in the international arena. And I'd love to, this, this is an obvious slide to you, right, Silas? This yep. is your, your preaching to the rest of us. Tell us what's going on in China in e-commerce. Okay, before China, or compare China to the United States, let's first define um, the topic of your uh, conversation today is, will retail strive in the digital world? Okay, for me, first let's try to define what is retail. In the, everybody's mind, retail is brick mortar. Retail actually is a platform for a very basic, simple experience of every human being, shopping. Every human being want to buy something, want to own something, whether it's food or clothing or car or cell phone or television, everybody want to own something. Shopping is the end of the game, which is the desire and need of a human being to own something. Now, throughout the history of a human acquire something, first we go to the markets, and then somebody build shops, become brick mortar retail. But in the end of the end, brick mortar retail is only a platform. So from my point of view, that e-commerce, the digital world, is only another form or platform to reaching the shoppers, to satisfy their desires. So me, I'm in the brand name consumer product business. I love brick mortar uh, platform, and I think it will continue to prosper. I love the digital world, like mainly's world of e-commerce. They actually complement each other. Mm -hmm. It only gives the consumers, the shoppers, mm -hmm. a better experience. So they are not um, against each other. For me, in order to reach the consumers, to make them wholesome experience of Satisfies that desire of ownership of something, both will complement each other. And with Mindy's now thrown into entertainment, even better. So, in a way, that's what's happening now in China. Because China 
did not have the sophistication of last hundred some years of retail, brick mortar retail infrastructure. China jumped from a marketplace, which is farmers, to the modern world, the digital place. Will you pull That's up slide China, 14 to illustrate this point? Slide 14 shows the growth of the middle class in China and India. To your point, Silas. So in China, what happened is we didn't have um, line uh, 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 phones. So jump immediately to cell phones. Same, we didn't have shopping malls, we didn't have department stores enough. So directly jump onto uh, e-commerce. Today, China e-commerce is one company, Alibaba, is bigger than all the e-commerce United States combined together. Hmm. Whether you put it eBay, Amazon, everything together is smaller than one company in China. Mm -hmm. And there are many companies like that in, in China. However, what we are experiencing now, all the people who were pure play e-commerce brand names, they built their names, products, only on e-commerce. In the last three years, I was talking with uh, David, in the last three years, there's so many shopping malls has been built. The people who started their business on the e-commerce now start to build physical shops because the consumers don't like always look down on um, a, a computer or a mobile phone. Right. They also want the community that we were talking about. They want to meet with people, share with people, and they will compare, experience the whole uh, 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 satisfaction of their desire of ownership. So in China, yes, e-commerce very fast, but now emerging with physical retail. And I think in the United States, the same thing is happening. All the great retailers now embracing e-commerce, digital world, people like Macy's, Neiman Marcus, and ourselves, we are putting a lot of uh, uh, effort and investment. I think traditional retailers have to embrace the digital world because it's complement each other. We're in, we're in wholehearted agreement. <laughs> I appreciate your point about many of this, this rising Chinese middle class being digital natives, unlike us who are digital immigrants who've done business in an analog world, shopped in an analog world, and, and in a digital world. And I was talking with Jim Fielding, the CEO of Claire's earlier, and I don't know if you're that familiar with Claire's and icing, but Jim services Generation Z. How, what's your, how yeah. old's your target customer? <laughs> the target customer of Claire's is you know 11 to 14 icing, you know, 18 to 30. So for me, I mean, being, it's kind of Mindy's point, I mean, being digital, being physical, I don't have a choice because my consumers were born with a PDA in their hand. I mean, and if you go to any mall, any restaurant, any social place, you'll see two-year-old, three-year-olds on iPads on their mom and dad's phone. I mean, it's like a form of education and entertainment. So. Um, but for us, we're equally investing in improving our store environments and our online environments because to Silas' point is they're completely, you can't choose one or the other. Everything has to be the best. And with the Gen Z customer, young girls, because we are the store in the mall that loves to have the gangs of young girls come in. That is our entire in-store experience. Uh, she's creating that digitally now and we see it in our stores and we see it on Instagram and Vine and. Etsy and all of these new websites, she takes a picture of herself with the earrings or with the scarf or with the hat and sends it out to her community to ask if she should buy it before she buys it. Mm -hmm. And it's just her way of shopping now. She used to shop with five girlfriends in the mall, now it's herself and 500 people on her Facebook mm -hmm. or on her Instagram. And for us, Instagram is by far the most important platform for us to be a part of. Uh, we have over 90,000 tagged photos on Instagram without us really having a big digital strategy, where they wow. just tag Claire's um, YouTube, Claire's haul videos, we're in the three, four millions, where girls come into the store around the world, because we do business in 43 countries, they go in to stores around the world and basically video their entire experience and then come out and show what they bought and why and post it. And so we have this huge community, and I think David said it too, that is totally connected around the world. And they 
do not know silos, they do not know uh, distribution channels, they right. don't know any of that. They just know Claire's and they want to interact with us or icing uh, wherever they want to interact and whenever they want to interact 24 seven. And if you're not enabling that and being part of the conversation, I think what Mindy said is huge. You've got to be part of the conversation because if you don't, they're gonna go to one of your competitors. And you know, we, I spent a lot of time at Disney uh, before this job and what I liken it to, because I'm always on these panels about are retailers gonna thrive, because uh, yes, brick and mortar retailers can thrive in this environment. I liken it to all the doom and gloom stories of how home theaters and DVDs were gonna kill the movie theater business. Mm -hmm. They were absolutely gonna kill the movie theater. No one was gonna go to movie theaters. By the way, global box office the last five years has broken records around the world. Why? People love community. They wanna watch the movie in the theater. They think the quality is better. And I think that goes back to quality and experience and differentiation, which is the same thing we have to do in retail. And it's what we're doing at Claire's and Icing every day. But it also goes back to the reason why China was able to leapfrog so aggressively is they didn't have the negative legacy, right? right. Do you remember when you know the whole e-commerce business started? It was looked at as competition right. to the right. brick and mortar business. So you're actually infighting amongst yourself, and people had fiefdoms not recognizing that it wasn't about them, it was about the customer expectations. Right. And the expectation today is she wants to interface completely on her terms mm -hmm. and she doesn't really care about your divisions or your people mm -hmm. or who's getting paid what. And I think what, what happened, I think the retailers obviously who are performing is they have a vision for that, but their incentives are also aligned right. against yes. a global Yep. perspective on what the gets customer. measured gets done how right. people get paid is what drives the business well, the, the sure. word I mean the word in retail used to be cannibalization I mean five yep. years ago you would hear retailers yeah. say and the question would be is your e-commerce business cannibalizing your brick and mortar right. business right. that's what the topic of the panel would be that word if you're the right in the right frame of mind as a retailer is gone now because honestly I don't care where she shops with us I don't care if she shops in a store or online or through Facebook or Twitter or social commerce, any of those places, as long as she's happy with her experience and the product she gets. And you recognize her across all those Completely. platforms. She wants Otherwise, to she's her. gonna think it's a disconnect. Absolutely. So John, we were talking about um, the effect of sales tax on this mm -hmm. migration and what while we were asleep, you know, in the past decade, <laughs> Amazon <laughs> drove convenience and price and is the price leader across the planet, really, in the United States, and mostly, is the price leader. And there are other people who consider themselves the price leaders who've had to really be on their game in a different way because of price transparency on the internet and mobile. What do you think the impact of potentially taxing, because we've basically advantaged online-only retailers, what do you think is going to be the effect of some of these sales tax legislations out there? Well, it'll, it'll it, it, clearly it's going to uh, put a great pause on on some of the momentum and particularly in some of the states and it's fascinating to watch the politics play out the the no sales tax states yep. are against it because they've they've benefited from it uh, there's some categories where probably it's lost and, and you know one of the companies that I've, I've watched for many years is Barnes and Noble and if you think about it, you had two problems one is you could buy a book it was Amazon sort of first it's it's sort of beachhead, so you could buy you could buy books and they and and the online basically offered uh, unlimited selection. If you look at the P's, price, place, people, etc., unlimited selection and also competitive prices. And 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 this was sort of the offensive part of it is that Amazon could sell a book into Los Angeles, California, uh, and they had a nine percent cost disadvantage on a thirty percent gross profit product and we and you think about it what's their argument for it their argument is well we deserve that because we have no we don't employ people we don't have any stores we don't pay taxes we do nothing for california so we deserve to have this cost advantage now that's going to change it's interesting there was some there was some uh, uh, uh new york times had an article on it today but as it relates to barnes and noble when it when the product became digital when it became digital books that's where it really, where they really got clobbered because what happened was uh, their electrons are exactly the same as Amazon's electrons and Amazon's electrons are ten, 9, nine or 10% cheaper. At this point, it, you've probably gotten to the point where I'm, I'm not sure they can come back in the, di in the digital, in that area. 
But most other categories, uh, what I sort of see it doing is sort of slowing the momentum of one. Uh, the, the price shop will not be quite as, as obvious. I think there will also be a, 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 uh, an interesting uh, blowback because Calif people may, be, may or may not be aware, California right now is sending out taxes due notice mm -hmm. because the individual is responsible for the taxes on things they bought. And the information is being provided to them by Amazon. So there's, there's, there's going to be sort of that sort of human uh, 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 public relations nightmare to work its way through. But, you know, it, it's sort of one of those things that, that sorted out. You know, my view on Amazon it, itself is, and it's fascinating if you look at the timing, Amazon is, Sears and Roebuck in 1890 <coughs> came up with the catalog. Amazon in 1990 came out with a catalog in a different form. It's a catalog that's mm -hmm. updated, that, that is, can be priced uh, uh, on a daily basis. But it's basically the same business. And at the end of the day, catalog business in this country sort of topped out at about 15%. And, you know, I don't, I don't know that pure online sales will get much beyond that in my lifetime. Well, let me just, let yeah, me I just, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go That's on, good. no, go on. Let me, let me just add to the having lobbied, uh, and you can imagine I'm not the world's greatest lobbyer, but <laughs> having <laughs> lobbied on the behalf of, our, for the benefit of our retailers for three or four years now in Washington, um, I think it's a significant difference because, um, and it will have a significant impact because what we uh, kept seeing was a number, especially the, the bi bigger ticket items, showrooming, going to the store, looking for the product, uh, and the consumer's no dummy, we all know that, uh, because it's a she, not a he, right? The vast majority. The vast majority. Statistically. Um, and absolutely going online and buying it and saving the 8% tax. So um, we finally got Congress uh, to recognize that, and I think it's going to have a, have a significant impact on that aspect of it, uh, and that's going to level the playing field. And, and, you know, the tax is owed, by the way. It's a use tax, and, you know, you're supposed to, s supposed to, um, uh, pay it, but of course no one does. But I, I do think it'll absolutely level the playing field and, and hopefully eliminate um, this one big issue of just going into the store. It's, it happened in diamond rings. It's happening obviously on the on the electronic side, uh, but it's it's a big issue, and I'm I'm glad we're finally making progress on that to address it. Is the is the compliment to that though those retailers who sell high consideration, high risk occasion purchase items, isn't, the, isn't it their responsibility to provide awesome experience in the store sure. with research capability the way that a, a former well, they, competitor they were. has? Well, like they, they were. So think about uh, a jewelry store going through the diamond, going through this, uh, and convincing them to buy, right? right? But then they go to Blue Nile and buy online. Okay? Because? The sales tax. Right. Well, because okay. it's cheaper. Right. Well, because of this odd, right. odd uh, set of circumstances that they were able to take advantage of. Right. So, but so they did acquiesce. They they basically let the competition be formed all around them. Well, right? but it but yeah, but they didn't have. I mean, it's in a sense the government shouldn't decide who wins and loses in when it comes to uh, when it comes to those kind of matters. It, it, in fact all matters, but it certainly shouldn't come to those matters. What were you going to say, Mindy? So one of the things that uh, I think it's really important to talk about, that we're talking about experience, when we're talking to everything else, at the end of the day, what the consumer takes home is product. Right. And to me, great product is the price of entry. And I think what's happening is the more you can differentiate your product offering, so you're not a price engine exercise. I mean, for us, 70 to 75 percent of all the products we sell are exclusive to us. You cannot get it anywhere else. And in the areas that electronics or prestige beauty, uh, you where you stores. can, you really, we try. You really pardon me. Need Let's get a deal stores. done, David. Let's get a deal. You need stores. You never know. I'm taking I'm a out of it, Mindy. Never. Well, that's what um, Silas was saying. Yeah. But the, the, key, the key that, and Silas said, 
Um, at the end of the day, what people want is to get excited about acquiring things. And the way they get excited is if you inspire them, no right. matter how you inspire them. It's great product in our world, you know, great product, great story, great storyteller. Retail still storytelling, mm -hmm. no matter where you tell the story, but what they take home is product. And you know, I, I think, you know, you have mm -hmm. almost all proprietary products. Yeah, 96%. Um, so I, I, I think that the real onus on uh, retailers as well is differentiating themselves in, yeah, in I that think, capacity. I think, too. Absolutely. I think what's interesting, what you say, is tell the story. Part of what our job as, a, as, the, as the guy that owns the mall is to give you the platform. When I mm -hmm. talked about it earlier, is how you tell the story. So mm -hmm. we have the vision that, you know, technology in the mall environment, yeah, uh, obviously will help facilitate shopping quicker, more efficient, but also give you the right or the ability to tell your story in some some mm -hmm. setting that you can't. You know, what's fascinating to me about the mall is that they're on average. 120 stores, the average consumer goes to six or seven stores. So if we, if we, and kind of, they kind of know where they want to go, but if we have the ability to give you the platform to tell the story, you've got new mm -hmm. merchandise in, mm -hmm. or you've got a new promotion, we give you the platform to do it. I think that's going to give you, and that's kind of where we think we ought to be ultimately. Uh, in our own physical environment, as well as digital, uh, too, because we can clearly give you the environment mm -hmm. to do that. One of the themes that David's touching on is those of us who are partners and own huge networks, places where people are gathering, places where people are coming and going, you, we really need to reskin the business and think about the way media channels think about operationalizing space and engaging a whole, along the whole journey digitally or throughout the whole mall. It's a huge opportunity to really provide promotional platforms right. for your partners in the stores, what we were talking about earlier. In a couple of minutes, we're going to open up to questions. So we have, a, we have a microphone in the middle, and then we have some people, I believe, walking around with microphones. But we wanted to make, um, yes, Silas? Yeah, just make the story a complete, I just want to tell a story everybody knows. Not many people really realize. In the digital world in the last 10 years, the most sellable product is the iPhone and iPad and computers and the mobile phones. And who built the most beautiful, unprecedented brick and mortar stores Apple. in the world? Apple. Was Apple. <laughs> so I have no doubt if you have the right product, whether you through the digital world or through brick mortar, you have to provide the best experience for your consumer. And great Speaking service. Speaking of which, fun fact. Oh, you will build a lot of stores with Simon. <laughs> fact, speak, speaking of which, you know who was supposed to be on this panel, right? We know that. We won't say that. Okay, so we'll keep that to ourselves. Uh, we, we were previ previously we had Ron Johnson, the former CEO of JCPenney, engaged um, on the panel, which he you know he obviously did a terrific job in the launch of the Apple stores. Um, and we not so good at Penny though. Oi, 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 oi. One last point before no press in here is there? Um, we are on videotape. Plus, you know, don't you want to be a nice guy? I'm, I'm a but before we um, before we open up for questions, before we open up, um, I thought we could go around the room and really just raise our hands and talk about some ways that you're using technology to enable the in-store experience. Great things that investors here, or other professionals, we have the CEO of Foot Locker here in the room with us. What other professionals can take away with from this conversation? Or who are you really seeing do great stuff that you're admiring and who's inspiring you to move faster? You want to go first, John? Uh, well, I think uh, in terms of uh, apparel, probably I'd probably go with Nordstrom's. You know, they've got the uh, they've got a great experience, free shipping, free returns. Um, you know, I think in terms of omni channel, and you can take it back to any store. I think in terms of omni channel, they're doing a fantastic job. So they're thinking about the stores as distribution outlets, in, out, and in. They, they just want it. They just want it to be seamless. I would like to make one point, and, and really this sort of building on, on, on Silas is, you know, we have five senses. And again, those five P's of retailing are important. Uh, the internet on it, 
in and of itself can only address two, mm -hmm. price and product, product being defined as selection, so the amount. Yep. In terms of the other, uh, they, they really can't compete. And, you know, it's interesting, we're talk David was talking about uh, uh, um, electronics and, you know, TVs, it's a high, a high product, uh, high price product, eight, $900, 8% add-on is expensive. On the other hand, if you talk to most people, it's an important purchase for them, and they would really like to see it. They'd like to look between them, even though it becomes something of a commodity product. So again, once that sales tax thing is, is gone, and uh, Best Buy, of course, has now said, we're gonna price match, you've, you've, so you've addressed price. At that point, I believe the other, um, the other senses take over, and you're gonna wanna feel it, you're gonna hear it, you're gonna wanna touch it, and by the I way, you're going to want to tell you how many you're gonna want, I sell. And you're going to want to take it home. And, and, you know, just to go through a few. And by will. the way, they're losing their TV sales, not to you guys. They're losing it to Walmart. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting on that. If you look at what, and, you know, just from an outside, and, and a, a, there's been a lot of commentary on it. If you see where Amazon is headed, it's for that instant, immediate gratification that people right. get when they're shopping. Mm -hmm. So. You know, that's why they have distribute, you know, their, their ultimate goal looks like it's very expensive. And that's why we think the mall is actually a very interesting position in this, whole, in this whole area. But Amazon clearly is setting up for same day delivery in a lot of markets. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the thing that they're missing is that instant gratification that when you do go to a physical environment, uh, you can do that. So. Um, Impulse. Impulse. Yeah, and yeah. convenience. If I look at uh, a retailer who I think is doing it really well globally is Burberry. Yeah, um, I agree. Not only have they re-energized, I just was in their London store last year that is very technology oriented, but to create an experience, if you look at just what they did with the art of the trench and yeah. sharing, I mean, they were able to increase their business in that category by 50% by creating conversation and experience. So I think they're, they're doing a great job. And to that point, you know, one of the things that we've seen be very successful, um, you know, just like they had customized your own trench, for example, mm -hmm. we launched something called Dress Shop where the customer could go in, we expanded our assortment significantly, and she could actually take a style quiz. Um, and shop by body type. So after that, we were able to serve her up curated and personalized content that was specifically for her. Now, once I have that information, anytime we get new product in, and I think what people are really uh, responding to is that nature of personalization even within <coughs> a product category. So those sorts of things are, it's kind of like when you know, you're sending pictures of your friends and you're going, how does this look? Well, it's more for me. Right, yeah. right. The ability, technology as the enabler to customize. Anyone else? I mean, I think um, for us, we, <laughs> we admire a lot of people. We look honestly at a lot of stuff that Mindy has done with her team. Um, I think in the UK, to David's point, because we have such a strong presence in the UK, I mean, there's so many great retailers there doing same day delivery. Mm -hmm. I mean, and uh, it's, just become the norm. So we look at ASOS, we definitely look at Burberry. Um, I think we always admire Lululemon for what it's been able to do mm -hmm. digitally and physically in building community. Um, so I think there's a lot of people to benchmark off of. I think I'm really excited to hear David say, as far as what we're doing to invest, I'm really excited to hear what David's saying about investing in the mall. We're investing in all of our new and remodeled stores, just making them Wi-Fi enabled. And that seems really minor but we're not right now. And so it's really hard to say you're a seamless digital physical connectivity if they walk into your store and they yeah. can't even get on. Especially to your on customer who, exactly. who expects so it like running water or electricity. It's those little things, and if the mall was Wi-Fi enabled, that would save us a lot of money. So I'm gonna talk to David about that. I'm but, glad um, I could be of service, yeah, David. Exactly. Um, <laughs> As long as Mindy opens stores, <laughs> to get the rent going. It'll we'll, we, you know, we'll talk later. Yeah, everything's yeah. a circle. Right? So do we? Have I'm any, sure I'll get a deal. <laughs> uh, of course, of course. Do we have any questions in the crowd? We have a. Do we have a microphone we can pass around? There's a microphone in the. Oh, it's stationary in the middle of the room. I'm happy to repeat your question if you'd like. <laughs> Will you tell us who you are, please? Yes. Hi, I'm Jason Rapp uh, from the Science Group. 
uh, to Mindy and, and Jim, there's some interesting uh, buying pattern models like subscription commerce, like Birchbox in New York or Dollar Shave Club here in LA, mm -hmm. uh, push commerce where some personalized goods are sent out ahead of time, mm -hmm. uh, flash sales like the Guilt Group. Mm -hmm. uh, which of those are interesting to you and excite you? And I suppose to John, at, at what point do those become interesting to you? I think there are elements of any uh, new emerging way mm -hmm. to uh, reach the customer that are interesting. So for example, in the subscription model, we actually have had a partnership where we've sold that subscription model on um, TV. We have something called auto ship where the customer can sign up and be able to get products, whether it's the sampling piece of it, like a birch box, um, or they can just buy their mascara. We're one of the few people that are able to do that. We have found that from a loyalty factor, that's really terrific. In terms of the flash sales, um, you know, I, have, I have two perspectives on it, because at the end of the day, are you really loyal to that retailer? Or are you loyal to that product that you want? And I think the people who are doing it the best are creating community. So if you look at fab.com, for example, you're not just going there because you're getting a percentage off a price. You're going there because mm -hmm. it's creative and it's unique. You it's open, curated You open you. their emails because they make you smile and yep. they're fun. So it can't just be one proposition. You have to wrap it around. So I, I think they're, they're all interesting, but the, the takeaway is um, that Impulse is great, so any mechanisms that could drive that. Loyalty is great where you get continuity. You just have to customize it for your own environment. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say, opinion on what Mindy said, I'm, I'm obsessed currently with Stella and Dot. Um, Fantastic. Yeah, that whole model. Yeah, that whole model that is whole. fascinating to me. And the word that you said that Mindy and I are totally grooving on is- Tell the group about Stella and Dot briefly. I call it Stella and Dot like the Avon ladies for the, the 2015, so it's this incredible, um, no offense if they're here, because um, it's much better than that. But it's all their it's, women are stylists. All their women are stylists, and their women sign up to be distributors, and they have home parties Little basically, cocktails. and over cocktails, and sell beautiful, one of a kind, you know, jewelry, earrings. It's really incredible. And I think the key word in this environment that you said, and that I'm obsessed with too, is curation, because I think the change in what's going on in the digital space is, uh, Mindy and I were talking about this, when Amazon first started, it was about having the most, right? I have thousands of mm -hmm. SKUs. I have hundreds of thousands of SKUs. What I'm finding now, and the people that I'm really interested in, in the digital and physical space, are the ones who know who their customer is, are very confident in who they're going after, are using their data wisely, and are taking edited, curated, focused assortments and that, and that, to those that customers. that benefits the physical store. It's, and it's, all, it's old fashioned merchandising. Right. Old yeah. fashioned, know who your customer right. is and tell them, lead them to what they absolutely have to And I, I think people appreciate that. We use the expression, there's the impotence of abundance. Yes. You know, there's just so much people kind of get frozen and if you can yeah. help them, yes. but also tell them why you're doing it and why this is for right. you, mm -hmm. like because Stella and Dot, totally. example, and the stylist is recommending specific products right. for you, it goes back to the intimacy piece. You can see that in the importance of search on the Google, Google driving search yeah. traffic. There's no, you, you don't go to page two, you don't go to page three. One of the top three right. is what you mm -hmm. click through because you trust Google as a curator and as a trusted right. editor of information. Yeah, Dottie, can I make w one point? Because again, if you look at this stuff and look at it over a, a long period of time, you realize there really is nothing new under the sun. <laughs> so, so for example, we talked about Amazon is now gonna have uh, local delivery. Okay, mm -hmm. Sears did that, they did it <laughs> right. in 1920. If you talk about uh, guilt and flash sales, there was that blue light special at Kmart. Kmart. I mean, again, yep. this stuff is not, none, none of this stuff is new. And I think if you want to sort of figure out where it, 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 it ends up in the world, it'll tend to kind of end up where it did, which is some things are going to be central to uh, a way of living and a way of shopping. Other things will just kind of be kind of nice little things to yeah, me. Yeah, and that's Silas. Flash sales, nice little thing. This is not going to revolutionize. Yeah, it's Silas's point. We get to know your customer, and your customer wants to acquire things, wants to experience things, and then how we deliver it is really up to us. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? There's a microphone right in the middle, or I'm happy to repeat your question uh, if you'd like. Here, yes? Uh, hi, yes, my name is oh, Justine Angeli. I'm a CEO of Share a Gift. Um, an online group gifting platform used as a plug-in direct on retailer sites. And uh, my question to the members of the panel is this. What do you think will be more important for sales going forward, price or community? Mm -hmm. 
I, I don't think they're mutually don't exclusive. Don't choose. Um, I think don't the customer is really smart, and she wants value. 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 And I think value is more important than price. Because somebody spending $2,000 on something wants value for that, and somebody that wants $19. I think that the customer is really smart, and they want it all. Um, and I think you have to figure out which levers you need to pull at any given point, depending on what the product is, what the competition is. But I, I don't think it's an either or. I agree. None of us. No, yeah. I totally agree. But, sorry, your question? Yeah. If sales tax is going to be added. Yes. What difference will it make to add more retail stores as far as their growth? So if sales tax is going to be added to internet stores, this gentleman's question is what difference will it make to brick and mortar retail growth? Asking for David's prediction. You know, it is hard to uh, to quantify, but it's certainly going to have some significant impacts on certain categories. That I, the, some of the ones that I mentioned before. Uh, so I'm not going to put a percent on it, but I think it'll be material. Um, because let's face it, how many people here, if I get a raise of hands, there's no IRS agents in there. <laughs> not that I'm but aware of. How many of. people here have said ship it or bought it online because of sale tax, right? Everybody has, right? Come on. Oh, come on. Don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, I think it's I think it's going to have a, a, a material impact and a psychological impact, and the thing that we've got to get out in the world is you know we are, the mall going back to the mall is so important to that community because of the sales tax that we generate, and the real estate tax that we generate. So if we can create the community, of the community, then I think we're going to get repeat business that we might not otherwise get because that community is really. That mall is really, really financially and hopefully spiritually and socially really important to that community. And that's the story that we've got to tell. And I, we need our retailers to do the same thing. We've we got to do it together. Yeah. We have a it's going to be important to employment as well, isn't it? Sure. should be important. It, it all growth, kinda, it growth, all, it's a virtuous it all, cycle. It does, no doubt about it. We have a question in the back. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Adam Kalish. I'm with Lux Capital. Thank you all for having me and asking the question. My question is, with the rise of mass optimization due to technology such as 3D printing, um, how will this all affect retail with companies like you know, Shapeways and things like that that can do just-in-time manufacturing, mass customization, and people not needing to buy, you know, have one of five choices, they can now have infinite choices? It should help us get to know customers better. It's just another way to bring content and design to a customer. If they end up producing it in their home, that's a piece of the value chain that the customer shares with us. But I would think that it's another great piece of technology that great merchants will determine how to employ. Yeah, again, it's sort of like engraving, right? Uh, you go into stores, they have a comment, and you have to get them engraved and customized. I, again, I think that's probably going to be a, you know, fringy stuff for many, many, many years. That's uh, that's you know one one other again to to David's point you just think about how the proposition for selling a TV just changed. Okay, in California, if you were buying a TV and you bought it from Amazon, you got it for five percent less. Today, if you buy it on Amazon and you pay shipping, it's five percent more. It's price is price which was there is gone as an issue. And once again, uh, the sales have not been lost to Amazon; they've been lost to Walmart. By the way, I'm on a, I, I'm trying to, John said it right, I actually think this is, now I'm trying to get somebody to, I'm trying to commission a study, but I think it's actually greener to shop at the mall than it is to do <laughs> shopping online, okay? So as we move toward a <laughs> green society, think about it, yeah, you, you had your carbon footprint to go to the mall, you, you, you have the, the gas, obviously we have to we have to heat and, uh, and cool them all. But think about all of the, all of the servers and the, and the UPS and the, and the trucks and everything else. So if there's any really smart person out there that wants to do that study for me, I'm ready to do it because I actually think. And you really we, think the customer is going to make a decision on where they buy because it's greener? I, I don't think, think so. I think it's part of helping and defining the community. So the answer is, it yeah. It might be a cost of time. entry one day. Everyone's yeah. going mean, to. I, 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 I think at the end of the day, they're going to want the product they want when they want it. I'll give you an example. You know, if Mark we're trying way. to sell organic, for example, 
in women's beauty products, all right? And if I go out, this is so organic, this is wonderful, they really could care less. What women want is, what is it going to do for me, and is it going to make me look immediately better? And then, oh, by the way, it's organic, it's great. I mean, I'm not saying it's not going to be important, and I think we all have a responsibility from uh, sustainability and you know, stewardship any kind of standpoint. stewardship, yep. but I don't think that's going to be the ultimate decision-making process on or, the yeah, customer. And I do think a different demographic. I think that there are our kids do see the environment in a different way. No, and, I'm not, I'm and not disputing that. Imagine, I'm just saying though, it's not going to make the Imagine the mall difference. is greener than buying online. And I, and I bet you when you add up all the, all of the numbers, we're, we're probably pretty close. Does that include the electricity to keep it open? Well, <laughs> or the, the shipping all the stuff to be warehoused in that the, mall? I just want to know how the, the organic the cloud, Botox you don't think the cloud uh, is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have a, the electricity. Hey, if you find it, let me know. <laughs> we have a question here right up front. Our question is about conscientious consumerism being connected to the maker and ethical shopping. Have you, you guys looking at what Shinola is doing, what's happening in Detroit that yeah. Tom Cartsotis is doing? I, I, th I think absolutely. Yes. Um, I think there's two parts of that. I think customers want to do business with companies that they feel have a sense of responsibility philanthropically to the communities and to society. The second is where they can also have a story behind the product. Now, they have to love the product first, but we have a business with a company called Bahalia, for example, and all of the products are made by women around the world, and they're taught jewelry making, et cetera. It's become one of our bigger jewelry brands. It's a beautiful product, but they love the story behind it, and women are really proud when somebody notices what they're wearing and they can tell the story, and I think storytelling in our world, whether it be in a brick and mortar store mm -hmm. or for me on television or catalog, the more meaning that story has, I absolutely think it makes yeah, it. I'll just give you our take as a landlord is that giving the ability of local merchants in our, you know, in our theory of trying to create community in the mall environment, giving uh, a platform for local, you know, the local jewelry maker, the local whatever, kind of the ability to uh, sell their goods and knowing that it's a local product, I think is a huge push for us to, uh, to, uh, to move on. So it, I think it's really important. But, it, but the broad category is curation. Right. So, so it, it's, it's fundamentally uh, a, retail, a retailer or a site that organ, organizes itself so that it addresses those, that consumer's values. So Whole Foods, for example, does a great job of basically addressing people's uh, desire to have uh, healthy eating. And as it relates to the issues, uh, socially conscious, they do it, Trader Joe's does it, other folks do the same thing. It's curation. It's sort of it basic retailing. Ken, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm, I'm Ken Hicks. I sell sneakers. <laughs> I, think, I think the panel's done a great job challenging some difficult issues. And I appreciate you all being up there and not me. Um, the challenge that I think we face, and Jim hit on it, and it's we need the help from uh, our landlords, is how do we create an environment that is enticing mm -hmm. for that young kid so that they get in the habit of coming into the mall and not being chased from the mall, right. and that they can use they're wireless because the mall is Wi-Fi enabled yeah. and they can have things at the mall that are entertaining for them. Because if they get out of the habit, when they're the age mm -hmm. right. that you know we would really like to have them, although I really like to have them when they're young just as Jim does, <laughs> they won't come. They'll be used to sitting in front of their computer or TV buying things. Right. And so we've got to figure out what are things that we can do to make the mall more enticing to the younger kids? Well, uh, no question about it. Um, but we also have to have a safe environment. So you always balance the safe environment with 
you know, what's going on with the teenage, and each situation is a little bit different. But, um, you know, we, we have a responsibility to drive traffic. Uh, the, the mall originally, was, the traffic, uh, the department stores used to be, they got the best economic deals, just to take a step back. <laughs> They got the best or, you know, free land, free site or very low rent because they ran promotions, they drew the traffic, and that the, 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 the retailers in between were then able to essentially wow. take advantage of that. Well, that's changed. I mean, there are a few department stores that still do that. So that responsibility and role now is on us, and uh, we take it very seriously. We do... We've had uh, one of these slides up here, and I won't, I won't uh, make you find it, but we, we've run 20,000 events a year to drive traffic. Now, it may not be your focus just on the, your, your, your particular demographic, but it's incumbent upon us where it used to be on the department stores to drive traffic and create an exciting em environment. It's really up to the mall landlord. So there's lots of ways we can do it, better mix, better promotions, great events, better communication to the customer. I've got tons of slides here that I'll show you. I'm seeing you in a couple of weeks. I'll tell you all about it then. Um, but but it's, it's our job now. It's that simple. And uh, we take it, you know, w there's nothing we're working on more than that uh, today because we can't rely on the traditional department store to drive that traffic the way the model was originally built. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ken. Did you have a question? The question is about the impact of income tax, payroll tax on consumer spending. Yeah, Q, Q, effectively Q1. It, it's really interesting, and I'd be, it'd be curious, particularly Jim, maybe you have a perspective, mm -hmm. but this year has, has started out slow, and I think actually slower than has been, com than has been um, sort of commonly perceived. Maybe it's, it's starting to, I think, kind of wander out there. Uh, and it seemed to coincide with all of a sudden everybody's paycheck went down 2%. Makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, last year we had the absolute perfect storm of no storm. We had a spring that started right. as early and was as wonderful as ever. So everybody sold through at full price, uh, got their gross margin, and the clear outs, the close out to the ends were nothing. This year has been exactly the opposite. So it will be fascinating to sort of see if it's just seasonal stuff if it's at everybody, every, every uh, apparel retailer is having to sell everything at 5% off versus what they usually do, you know, 5% less, affecting both top line, same store sales, and gross margins. Or whether it's something more sort of systemic to the government trying to remove or re reduce fiscal stimulus. My, my bet is it's somewhere in between. I think there's, there's, something, th there's something there, but I think this, the uh, season uh, is... Yeah. Has been lousy. It, it's interesting to John's point because I think there's been a lot of talk about the payroll tax, but I think if you go back to the beginning of Q1 for us, it was the perfect storm of the payroll tax, gasoline prices, the government being slow on IRS rebate checks, and in many cases eliminating. We we found in our customers, you know, there used to be you could go into H and R Block and if they did your taxes, you got the little stored value card for your refund, and they stopped that this year because the government was so slow in paying the refunds. And on top of that, absolutely the worst weather. I mean, the retailer's excuse, I mean, the brick and mortar retailer's excuse, the absolute worst, worst weather in most of the country in February and March and even into April for yep. those of us based in the Midwest and the Northeast. Still sucks. And so <laughs> when you look at seasonal businesses like sunglasses, sandals, um, shorts, things like that, they are much, much slower this year than they were last year because most people are still digging out of snow or floodwaters or whatever it could be. So I think it's hard for us to peel back the layers of the onion to say what happened, but we did see at the beginning of the quarter traffic drop. Can, and it, can, I, can I definitively say it was the payroll tax? No, I think it was the combination of 
all of it. And we've been getting our way back on the traffic numbers throughout the whole quarter. And when spring break came and Easter came and you had some things to celebrate, you saw the traffic come back. But um, the beginning of, of the quarter was, was slow. We have 60 seconds left. So how about a quickie? Okay, I have a question for Siley. Um, is Alibaba establishing physical points of presence in China to complement the e-commerce division? And do you think any American merchants can learn anything from the Chinese exchange? So the question is, is, is Alibaba going physical? And is there anything for us to learn from, from Alibaba in the US? 40 seconds, Silas. Alibaba is only a, p a, a, a platform. So it's not going to build stores. However, whoever sell on Alibaba as a platform, the brand owners, the product uh, 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 providers, they are building many stores because there are thousands, if not millions, uh, shopping malls being built in China. So whoever's selling on Alibaba now is starting to sell in the physical stores. Great job, Silas. 32 seconds. Well done. <laughs> Thank you all for being here with us. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>